topics at RC2 Communications. I will share the, the link to the blog post. Um, workshops, I assume there were new workshops announced. That's what I saw, so we might want to talk about it. Um, demos, Antoine, Dean. I haven't actually got anything today. You got nothing today? Not really, no. Okay. So we can talk about the improvements I did, but it will, it will be quick unless Bertrand has an update on any demo. I don't have a demo, but I'm hoping that I might have one in maybe a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. Cool. We'll be there. I know. Well, we hope we'll, we'll be there. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that and 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 uh, Orchard One. Orchard One, and I need to open that. So last week was the 23rd, and there was nothing merged since then. The last one was the lock here. Um, Orchard Call 23rd, so here. Uh, fixes media field update if there is no existing image. Yeah. I hate that thing. What is that? Oh, uh, so I assume this is when we were double clicking or clicking to click on the publish button and it will lose the media. Yeah, this is just a fix following up from that. Uh, Pierre, Pierre Grimaud, uh, talk fixed typos. Typos. Okay. And Pierre Grimaud as a contributor, it's like, oh, there it's the bot who did that. Interesting. Yeah, you can add a comment uh, saying, uh, please add a uh, Pegrimo as a okay. so you made a comment and it is added automatically. I see. Yeah, it creates a PR and you can merge uh, the PR. Fix okay. even path liquid filter to support arrays. Yes, you made the JSON parts, I remember. And whoever reviewed the PR didn't see that it's not following the, the format. The format um, here is so a parse value to support arrays jtoken.parse instead of jobject.parse. Okay, so it supports anything then. And if it's an array, just return parse value. What was the code before? New object value. So you don't, I think, you don't have to test for that. You can just say, um, well, it's a J object. I might, it might just work because we already have the conversions from any J token to any fluid value because we have to support um, accessing all the J object types of properties. So we have already done that. So I assume that we could just say return this line without the test here. And it will just work. Even in the case of an object, it will just, I think, uh, work. Unless this is a special, uh, it might be a special one, but we should still have um, a way to, to configure it outside. So it, it, it's automatic that we use an object value for anything that is a J object. And it is probably related to what I will show you after in an, uh, with an enhancement of uh, fluid I made. Uh, we'll see. Then the idea is that if you have a string, then if you if you test the JTOKEN type, you need to test everything, I think, because here he updated for the array, but what if it's a string, an integer, date time? Well, I'm not sure you can find it's a date time, but yeah. Formatting, thank you, Jerry, is in my mind. In the future. Shortcodes in sample theme widget templates. 
yeah, we talked about it last week. Um, it's about using short codes instead of the liquid parsing uh, where it doesn't accept liquid and where it renders HTML. Okay. Preserve shape name if type only differs by display mode. Um, so we talked about it on Thursday. The idea is that now, even if you use a different shape, the shape type will be the same. A niche fix, but it's a good fix. That, yeah. Whatever, remove a weird character. Yeah, maybe copy paste. Sorry. When I refactored that, I must have copy pasted the code from somewhere or some white space here. Fix issue of multiple image add, fix resize plugin, script dependencies, multiple image add. So JavaScript improvements for the media manager. Okay. Or well, actually it's trembling. Is it for the media manager? Or just integration of the media manager in Trembowin? Looks like so. Okay. I fix is shape items ordering. <sighs> I wonder why six, three, four, four. I want to understand what's the difference. So the um, issue was that um, using sort on a list is unstable over 16, I think, um, unpositioned orders. So sometimes if you have more than 16 shapes, it was happening on menus and in the widgets list that didn't have a position, they'd be resorted randomly. It's funny when previewing the other shuffles. The other shuffles. It's interesting. But it means that whatever I see because it's a flat position comparer, so most of the positions are not set or equal. For widgets, that's weird, widget this part, because that would mean that the value that it's comparing is the same. And because it's not stable, then it will shuffle it, because they're all the same. But if they were actually different, they would be stable, because the order will be stable. So it's really interesting to see what was the value of the position of these items that you will see some shuffling. Or maybe yeah, it's because we, we just don't we have them. About it. We talked about it at named JT because um, it, it, they're unpositioned shapes, but they're um, added um, just with shape.add. Um, so what we also realized was that it happens on menus as well, because again, they're not positioned, they're just kind of added in a, a for each loop. Um, so we'd have to change the code in a lot of places to keep using sort. Um, but he also found a PR from one of the ASP.NET guys, um, which had improved the performance of using order by.
We're looking at it. That's uh, interesting. Um, good. Safe token support to authentication providers. Um, so this PR is because a month ago, a contributor implemented um, token serialization interface for SPNet identity, such that the user tokens are stored now inside the user object. Um, and this one is just sitting, this PR from Michael is assigning this property of ASP.NET identity to reuse the configuration. Well, it's creating a configuration such that you can define for each of the providers if they should store the, the tokens. Because now there is a provider to store them, but if you don't enable the feature, it, the, the provider won't store them. So that's what it is, adding a setting. And I think the setting is for each provider. Yes. And then for each provider on startup for the options, it will set the value of the option. So this one is just a route, but not this one either. But somewhere, yeah, connection options, for instance, here. So it's taking it from the settings and then setting the options on the provider. So that's what it is. Thank you, Michael. Um, menu display text differentiator classes to menu shape, just to be able to uh, differentiate the menu based on the differentiator, so the name of the menu. With a class. Okay, could be improvements. We saw the demo last week. Fancy stuff. Fix it. There is a fix. Here is a fix. So, a fix was done. Um, your contributor, who is that? Client. Tabs, cards, and columns for the admin. So this has been merged. We saw a demo last week. We can have now cards. and columns. So what is a column? I don't know. So a column is a, a bootstrap column, um, which allows you to move, say, a, a text field or something into, you know, a nine, column and put a media field beside it of, of three. So it's, yeah, and, and I ask the question because then it's independent from the zones. Uh, yeah, I and mean, it groups them into a, a grouping shape, which is just a, a rep and then represents what was moved into that How do you shape define it? from the zone. So if you have two shapes in a view and they both target the same column name, how do you find the size of the column? Um, with a modifier of underscore and then the column number. So underscore six will give you half width. Um, and, if, and if two shapes define different numbers, If two shapes define different numbers, then you should use two different groupings, two different names for the columns so that you can split them into two columns. Uh, 
so if you name one column, well, there's always a default column called content. Um, so if you named content underscore nine for one field and column two underscore three for, for another field, then you'd get your total of 12 that the bootstrap gives you. Um, and you can put another modifier on the end of that to decide whether the content column or the col2 is the, the first one. Disposition modifier. Um, there's a PR sitting there with some docs um, explaining exactly how to do it. Yeah, um, a trick I learned is instead of doing that and then substring that, you do a split with the char comma two. This way it will give you either one or two values. If you have two values, it's because it's separated. If you have one, it's because there is nothing. So you can just get the value. It's easier than just getting the index and um, then that doing a test usually. Oh, cool. I'll have a look at that. And it also handles usually when you have, um, yeah, and if and the fact that you can pass an, a number in the split, here you do an index of, that's different, but if you do a split with a char and you pass a value, you won't have more than that. So if you have multiple underscores, it will still split on the first one and stop stop the splitting. Um, but yeah, it works. Okay, thank you. Improving things. Okay. Yeah, I. Okay, this space here. This is for formatting, but oh no, this is there is a code. Okay, there is a comma here, so that's fine. Um, okay, more localization. Hints font of some five thirteen display more media in library because not enough media in library to be. Maintain many item raw data when validation fails. Uh -huh. Okay. Shape. Oh yeah, I, I, I saw that going um so now you have the name property well the shape factory instead of an okay because that's what the comment i made which is that you have we have the new so you only have the dynamic version of the shape factory and with that if you have a property name shape factory an argument name shape factory then you will have the strong well Okay, yeah, because you don't want to use a name new. Doesn't make sense. Shape factory is, is more obvious to you than new. Did you change the doc for that? Do we have any doc explaining how it works to create shapes from um, shape providers and the parameters? Uh, I've that not, yeah, I've not seen any docs for any of that. <laughs> This is mostly just used or totally just used for creating shapes from code rather than than views so everybody knows yeah but i remember in option one i could never find the list of properties i can access in a shape provider and even less where it was defined uh, yeah it turns out you've got to look in that file because that's where they're all defined yeah. Um, I discovered when I went looking for them um, for that same reason. 
Um, I mean, you have the service provider available in the display context, so you can you can get whatever you want. But it just it just makes sense, I thought, to have the shape factory there as well. This one there is the new the new property. Okay. Typos. Interesting. Well, I'm sure I will state on purpose. <laughs> Um, Marked on table in OpenID doc. Okay, why is that? Because MKDocs uh, doesn't recognize a table without uh, headers. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, took, it took me a few tries to make it work. I see. So you are announcing that this is not the final one, and now you found, okay. Good. Um, and also, indented list wasn't uh, well not working. Fix tag editor prefix. Tag editor prefix. Oh, okay. I was like, what is a tag editor? Okay, the, okay, the tags editor. Okay, I see. Tags editor. Um, prefix. Uh, just because I wrote bad code way back when I first wrote it. Unhandled exception recipe important file is not zip or JSON. Okay. Um, okay. Title part with render title option and place. Ooh. Render title false. We have the setting. So this is exactly how we said we should do that. So now when you have title part, rendering it is option. And in the migrations, is there anything for widgets here? For the form label. You can still override this with the template, right? The template. What do you mean with a template? Yeah, I mean, yes, the part itself in this case won't be rendered, but if you create a template, you can just access the display text and render it either way. Yeah. I, I mean that you can have a in template something to hide the, the title. That I'm, yes, you, yeah, you, yeah, you just say don't render the title part. You can say remove yeah. title part. Yes, you will remove the part itself. The, the shape from the title part in the template. Yes, you can do that. Um, but in this case, the issue was that even in the editors, you will see the title, or you could see two titles, one from 
a thing and then one from title part. I, I don't remember exactly the issue, but it made sense to be able to. We had many discussions about that. Yeah, yeah. one of the issues was, is, and it's mostly around widgets, um, is that there was no way to edit the display text of a widget. Um, so this kind of provides an option where you can put a title part on a widget so that you can actually describe what it is yeah. if you've got 10 widgets on a page, uh, but that, that it won't be rendered. Um, so it makes it a convenient, easy setting for that. Um, you can still move it with placement, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes more of an editor for display text. Six menu differentiator. Is it based on the change from Jean Thierry with the? Yeah, we just missed a couple of properties. That, and I think there was another one. Oh, there we see here. Some shapes. Okay. Um, cache dependency tag helper. Cache dependency tag helper. Do we have a, so? Um, so we had a, we we had, a yeah, we had a, we had one of those for liquid, um, but I went to use it in Razor the other day and was like, oh, there isn't one. Um, so. I thought I'd write one. Um, I actually do have a question about that, though, um, if, we, if you've got a second. Um, there's a, a slight issue with the um, cache tag helper uh, um, being called by the ASP network as well. Um, so when you when you target cache, um, our dynamic cache tag helper calls the um, ASP net call one as well because they're both named the same. Um, so you end up caching twice. Can you find an issue? Yeah, I need to find an issue on it. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that. So I can understand exactly what's happening. Yeah. I, I wrote both the ASP net one and the alternate one. But I don't remember how it works and how it could be conflicting. I assume if they are using the same store and they have the same name, maybe there is an issue here. Yeah, I'll, I'll open it. I'll open the show. I, I mean, too. I just it's another one of those things. Six simple MD CSS issue. Let's remove the class and put it there. Why? So this is the markdown edit. Okay, this is the default one. This is the WYSIWYG one on which we use simple MD4. Okay. Same thing for the field edit and WYSIWYG. So what was the issue? 6546. Six. Must be a pull request. In this case, is this one multiple modern editors in the content type stop working? Because we removed the code mirror CSS from the admin. Okay. You see, with your change that improved the code mirror? Yeah. In this case, it's just the class that is added. So I don't see the relationship. It was also conflicting with uh, the CSS. Yeah, uh. For Okay, if you say quick. Good. And that's it. Okay, awesome job. 
buttons. Some new version we heard that there is. Larem, 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 Larem. While we have you, we added the topics about workshops. Is there any news about the workshops? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, good morning, good evening to all of you folks. Uh, we did the fourth workshop last weekend, and uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, very successful as well. So uh, we have upcoming workshops for uh, July 11th. That is for the theme workshop by Antoine. And then the fifth workshop will be in September by Bertrand. Uh, uh, so for now, we we have, I think, uh, four that signed up for July 11, and I think more than 10 for workshop number five. So I, I actually posted a, uh, a comment, uh, I think yesterday, uh, just reminding people there's another workshop too. So if you want to sign up, they can sign up. Yeah. My suggestion would be to remove the numbers here because you, you talk about the, the the number of machines, but in this case here now, there is a new workshop too, which is after the three and four, but July here appears there, so the date is not ordered. So if I look in the order, okay, June, June 27, and then where is the July? And actually I found it there. So maybe you should have kept like workshop two, three, four, make the, make the five be this one, like if you want, I don't know, but it's, it's weird that I couldn't find uh, this one. I because if I read that and I see J June September for me there is nothing in July, but yes there is one here. I yes yes I'll I'll, I'll work with Anton to clean this up. Yeah. If it makes sense for you, but I uh, workshop two. Yeah, it's not really the two now. It's the theming in Orchard Call, which happened sometime in May and now also in July. So I'm not sure that, yeah, I don't know. Um, or group them by name and have all the dates for each name. And you can filter or you can or filter by date if you want. And I don't know. You will find something even there. If it's an issue, if it's not an issue, don't fix anything. Um, okay, good, good, good. Uh, so yes, yeah, so Mark gave, one okay on uh, this Saturday. No, what? actually, uh, Sebastian, it was it was Sultan who did the, the workshop number four. Okay. And um, where did you host the meeting on the Teams chat room? No, no, no. What what uh, we did was we used uh, Zoom coming from uh, uh, the Lombic account, I think. Okay. Yeah, Lombik has to use their own stuff. Why would they do otherwise, right? Nobody from Lombik here today. Uh, that's what they do. You see that because even if they're in the... Let's take an issue, for instance. When there is a PR, they are not fixing an issue in Orchard, they are fixing an issue in their own issue tracker. See? So, um, topics that RC2, we got a blog post on the dev blogs, SPNet dev blog. I went into the WordPress admin to edit the blog post for the SPNet. This one, I can check if there were some comments. There are no comments. Um, so this is a blog post that got there. Lots of new followers on the Orchard CMS account since then. A good thing. I, it's slightly rewarded from the one we have on the Orchard um, core.net site, just to be more neutral towards ultra like there is a thing we don't tell you as the SPN team to use that thing but here is a new version 
um, a link also on the site. I even have little things to update. So that's good. Um, then, then, then demos, well, more about, not demos, but updates about uh, improvements in the libraries. So liquid, because this is the one, um, well, liquid. This is the one I updated first, so fluid. So the change I made was from a PR, some work um, from a PR from Sebastian Steele. Um, nice thing with Sebastian Steele is that the first thing which is nice is that he's using fluid engine uh, for JavaScript scripting like we do in Orchard Core, because he's um, the main developer on SquidXIO, which is a CMS on the net core. Mostly headless. I think it's headless. Is it just headless? So, and they're also using um, Liquid and JavaScript on the cell side, for the same reason as us and they're using fluid engine. So in this case, the PR, let me show you the, the commit. The, so improvements, so the unit tests, so the improvement on fluid based on his feedback and work is that, I will go on the readme to show you how we register a type. So in fluid, you can say register person to allow any object of type person to be accessed in a template, okay? Or you can say, say these are the properties we want. Then you can say if the object is a J object, um, then you can provide a lambda for this type that will return this type, okay? This is what we do in, um, in our trend. We register the type. Okay, so every time an object will be evaluated in the free template, there will be a, a dictionary, a lookup on the types, and it will bind to a specific lambda to convert this type into what we want to manipulate in the in the template. In this case, if you have a J object and the property is name, then access object dot Name. Okay. Another is a new thing, and I documented it. So I will go back on the PR because I can't find it. Crazy. Converter, converting serial types, yes. So type, yeah, the type mapping is what I said. So the register type to access property, but the time mapping, yes, here you can convert a G-object to a new object value. This is what we have in Orchard Core exactly. I, we saw that a few minutes ago. And for a J value, thread value that create, okay, that's it. But now there is a new thing, which is more flexible and actually could replace totally that thing, because here the limitation is that you can only pass a type. But with the change here is that you can say value converter and pass a lambda, and you do whatever you do you want in a lambda. So when it's finding um, an any property, any object, and you can then intercept it, intercept it, uh, intercept it, and say, if the value is this type, then actually I want to access this property. So it will convert automatically whatever you access to something else. And this is not forced to forcing you to use a specific type. In this case here, it's using an interface, but it could be any any predicate you want. It's just code. It will just run the code when it finds a specific value. And then if it doesn't, if your lambda doesn't return anything, then it will fall back to the type uh, um, mapping and then to the standard mapping that is included in Fluid. Like for instance, a string will be converted to a string value. So that's a new thing in, in Fluid. We might want to use it for some um, parts in Orchard Core where we do that kind of things. It might be easier to read or we might provide things like this with the I user. I'm sure that before that, we had to use the typed user object if we had some things like this. In this case, now we can pass interfaces. And that was the uh, original issue we wanted to fix with the PR to be able to filter on specific interfaces. And at first, it was trying to pass interfaces here. 
and it didn't work well. So we found a better way by passing a lambda and uh, accepting any predicate. It's up to you to define how it's filtered. And if there is none, there will be no perf impact. It won't be run. Um, so that's the improvement in Freed based on Sebastian's um, PR. So that's good. I think that's the only thing recently on this code base. A few fixes on the on some. Oh yes, what I did also. Um, where are the commits? Commits. The new UI. So here, more tests. And this one, I did this one recently. Uh, JSON. A JSON filter. And um, we already have it in Orchard Core, but I put it directly in Fluid. And I think it's fixing an issue I found. I don't remember, but we might want to use this one instead because there is one case that is handled that is not handled in Orchard Core. I think I found it when I was writing the unit test. Um, so we can remove it from Orchard Core now and uh, just use this one. That's the update on Fluid, and then the update on YesSQL. It's still a PR. Still a PR, but I will match it because I don't get the feedback I want from um, Sergio. Uh, maybe he's in vacation. He's unavailable right now, so he's not reviewing my PR, but he filed the issue, and he also provided one of uh, the PR for implementation, but after talking with him, we found a better implementation, which I implemented. And then, so the idea is that um, it's a rewrite of how collections are supported. Collections being that you can store documents in different document tables. So right now, when you do save an object, it will serialize it and put it in the document table. And every document will be in the document table. There was a way to do collections, but it was limited because you will share the same index for the, all the document tables, and you could not be able to do uh, transactions across two uh, collections. So during a session, you had to target a specific collection. And that was his limiting factor, the most, most of it. Um, so now you can do that. And also it's changing the API. It used to be a disposable object that would be like a context object um, for a collection. Now it's part of the API. So if I look at some tests, so the interface, for instance, you see here when you query, before it was just dot .query, and then you can do dot .where and so on, or get async and some IDs. Now for each method on um, the services, you can optionally say which collection you want to target. So you can query either the default collection or a specifically named collection. Uh, same thing for uh, registering index. When you register an index, you have to set the collection you want to register the index on, which means the same type. Let, let me take a very concrete example that will help us on uh, Orchard Core users. We have is an issue right now that uh, from uh, from devs that say that we that we agreed on fixing by storing users in two different sets because we might we might want um, the editors and the admins and contributors to be part of a specific set of users and the final users of the website the front end to be in a different sets a different set and a very a good example is with an e-commerce. Like, let's take Amazon. As me, Sebastian Ross, when I go to Amazon, I have a user account there. But I'm sure that someone who manages the, the, um, the Amazon site has a different, as an account, but in a different database, okay, or a different table, because you don't want to mix the, the roles and user accounts for your front-end users and your back-end users. And in this case, what we can do is with the same object type, which is a user in Orchard Core, we could say, based on where the user was created, we could target a collection, a default collection for the admin users, for instance, and a specific collection for the front end users where the user objects will be stored. And when we do a query on a user with a specific predicate, we can then select to query the admin users or the front end users. 
it will be the same query, but we can target a different collection. And even the collection name can be dynamic, so we could even store instances based on whatever parameter we want, and it will target a different collection. And in this case, we can also define indices based on in each collection and each type. So maybe the user by name index doesn't make sense for the front end users, and we don't have to register it and to store all the, to project all the users on a specific table. Or maybe you want a special index for the front end users, and we don't care about the admin users. Okay, so that, that's a, a way to do that, uh, to register custom uh, indices for each uh, collection. And not only that's a way to do that, but now that's mandatory that each collection will come with a document table and indices. And you can't share an index between two different collections. That's a, a new requirement in, in SQL with this PR. Um, and also the fact that um, when you do now, let me show you a, a test. So if I go on this PR to core test file, view um, file. Okay, so if I look at um, shoe store collection index in listing tables, not this one, commit in multiple collections. So here, I creating a session with the default collection. So it will be a document table. Well, sorry, I'm wrong. I'm creating a session. What I said is completely wrong. I'm creating a session. I create two objects and I save um, one of the objects, just this one. So this one, so with the same, you see, okay. With the same session, this object is stored in the default collection. This object is stored in collection one. So in the collection name collection one, okay? And then when the session is disposed, the transaction is um, committed. So we have one user in the first document table and one user in the second document table, which is called collection one underscore document. Um, and then we create another session. And when we query, we query on the collection one, any document, and we get one. And when we query without setting a collection name, then this is a default collection, we get also one document. Okay, so with the same transaction, we stored in two, doc two documents. Um, that was not possible before this PR. And this one is just, this test is just to check that when we query on indices, we also can specify which collection we want to create. So in this case, um, the same index is registered on two collections, on the two collections, the, the default one and the collection one. And we can query independently from each collection and it will use independently each, inde each index. So in this case, you see the person index provider is only registered on collection one. Currently it's not registered on the different collection. We still store one object in each collection, but when we do a query on the person by name index and we don't set a collection, there is none for the default one, but there is one object for the collection one. Okay, so that's that's the, the main change that will be included in one side merge this PR. It cool. should... How does the um, how does the flush work? Or the not the flush so much, but if you're doing queries across collections and the same oh, session gosh. and saving objects, yes. Um, does one collection, do both collections get flushed or just the one if you, if you make a query inside it? No, just all the, all the collections will be flushed. Is there an issue with that or is there an issue with doing the opposite? I didn't think about it, but... Uh, no, no, I just, I just wondered because the, the flush has always been an interesting thing um, and good to know what the behavior is really more than anything else. Yeah. So right now, I, I, the, the implementation is still fresh in my mind, just a week ago. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering. So right now it's flushing everything because it's just going over every collection and just flushing everything. And it's also optimized in a way that it will be batched if it can be batched because there was a batch update, um, a batch PR that was implemented a few months ago also. So it should be, yeah, it should be good. And I, I, uh, 
might be interesting no, to I, just I can't, I can't think of an issue. I can't, can't think of an issue with, with, with the flashing, but um, somebody else will. But might be might be something to consider, like flushing only the collection that you are covering on because you auto flush is to prevent like stale data that you are covering. So maybe you don't want to do that if you don't have to do it. And if you're just covering one collection, you might not want to flush the other ones. And they are completely isolated, so there is no way one flush and not the other would be an issue because there are two different collections, indexes, and tables. So, yeah, that. Oh, well, that might be an issue in case like in case like you expect it to be consistent across documents and indexes. So that might be also interesting actually to flush everything because. Another transaction outside of this one. Ah, it's not. If you do a read, yeah. If you do a read and committed, you might see only one document and not the other. Though the same document might be stored in the two um, collections. That's also something that should work. Um, I haven't done the test, but it will definitely work to be able to save the same document in two different collections in case it matters. Uh, yeah, oh. it could be useful. Looks good. And and I was about to say something. I don't remember. Oh yes, uh, breaking changes. All the APIs here to query and to save are not breaking because uh, we are not using collection in our shared core, so we are not using the old way of doing collections. So it won't impact here. But um, one breaking change is when we create an index. Uh, let me show you. Now, when we create tables in the migrations, when we create index tables, we need to pass the type and we didn't have to before. Um, here you see, before we, we were seeing the, the type name, user by name of something. So we were passing the name of the table. We can't pass the name of the table anymore. We have to pass the type because based on the collection, the table name will be different. So when we create a mapping and, and the, the logic to write the, the to create the, to, to compute the table name is internal. It can be customized later, but it has to be a specific logic. So you can't say you can't give a string anymore. So we have to pass the type of the index and not the name of it. So that's the only breaking change. When we create the, we will have to to change the migration. It's an API breaking change, but it's not um, a, a functional breaking change. Because the table names for the default collection will be the same. In this case, user by name. But when you use a collection, this will be different. So we need to pass the type now. So it's an API breaking change. Um, and that we have to react to and also module developers. Um, I could keep this overload, but that's risky and force it to not be able to pass a collection in this case, or make it obsolete and then let people know, yeah, maybe I should keep that and make it obsolete and let people realize that they need to use um, a type instead of a name here. It won't break them, but they have to react to that. That's the only thing. Is there a, a, a naming strategy for when these indexes get created in the and I run a collection. Naming strategy. Uh, the naming strategy is called stored get document table and get index table. And you can't, there is no um, configuration possible here right now. It will be super easy to implement, but right now I, I didn't care. So feel free to create a PR. Yes. I will totally Sorry. Sorry. So what I meant was is there a, a table naming strategy so that we can understand what table the index will actually be in or be called. Yes. Um, so if I go to get document table, so there are two strategies for the document itself. Table. It is collection underscore document table, which is document. Okay, so constant, which is document. So 
collection one underscore document or document if there is no collection. And for the index, it's collection underscore type dot name. And it used to be type dot name. Go, easy as. Yes. And uh, to fix it, to fix it, to update it, it will just be to provide naming strategy. And then when we call get documentable, it calls the naming strategy. So that would be super. I should, I'm stupid. I should have done that by default. It's not harder, it's better, but yeah. That's the way. So I guess probably my only concern was we, we did have an issue at one point with um, Postgres table names, I think, um, where we had to rename a whole bunch of classes because they were um, too long for Postgres. Yeah, the colon, the collection will definitely impact that. So yeah, we might want to plug custom naming policy so it will use a smaller thing. Or you could define for each table, what's the name of the table. For each collection, what's the name of the table. That, that will be part of the naming policy, your own custom one, which is for this type, use this name. Yeah, that would make that would and then, and then one could use an attribute and then yeah, but for that we need extensibility at least so that anyone can decide where it's coming from, either from the type or an attribute on the type or based on the dialect. I don't know. Not based on the dialect, but your naming policy will be based on the dialect. So yep, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe something to add also. Maybe do it before because because here is static get documentable and we might want a an instance one store. Um, if it's yeah, probably. Thank you for the feedback. Um, and that's it for the updates on these libraries. And 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 I make a, I made a huge update on the shortcodes, but it's um, Dean who is responsible for using it. I'm waiting for Dean to to make it great. It's coming along. I just have to rename everything. Yeah, so the, the issue that Dean is mentioning is that uh, he, he named shortcodes with a, an uppercase S and uppercase C, and in WordPress it's uppercase S and and everything is in the lowercase, and that's what the case I used. Uh, everything lowercase. So now we have a conflict. Uh, good. Uh, questions, comments. All good then. Um, let's see. Then, then, then. Thanks, everyone. See you on Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific time for the triage meeting.